This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So what I'm going to do today is really start with something that I think is fairly basic and will something that will be uh, hopefully become more self-evident um, with really a few definitions. I'm going to talk today mainly about our work, not our evolutionary work in our lab, but mainly on our work with respect to developmental delay and autism. And I thought it was important to kind of tell you what at least these are the operational definitions that I'm using to describe uh, the cohorts and the patients that I've looked at uh, with my group over the last six or seven years. So developmental delay is a, considered, a, as all of us would appreciate, a very umbrella term, which essentially means that kids aren't meeting milestones in a whole number of different areas. But probably the most noticeable within a cl clinical realm is that of really intellectual disability with respect to a kind of uh, milestones with respect to speech and others. It also falls under the category or includes things like epilepsy, autism, cerebral palsy, palsy and other disabilities. There's also autism spectrum disorder, uh, which is a fairly general term or uh, distinct from autism and being more broad in its definition, but actually a little bit of a smaller umbrella and includes uh, really, uh, really defects in really one, usually three domains, that of social interaction, communication, and also repetitive behavior and intellectual disability. And I thought it important just to show you a slide here. This is not really an epidemiological one, but just shows you what clinicians in one diagnostic lab have reported on patients coming in for diagnostic testing. And so you see that there's no such thing as anything that's completely independent from one another. A lot of these kids that came in, there's about 8,350. This is what a clinician reported in the, in the brief case history that was given associated with each one of these. But the important point here is that there's significant overlap between all of these different diseases. So epileptic patients often suffer from uh, intellectual disability. Intellectual disability patients are significantly enriched in cases of autism and so on. And I think this is an important thing because this is real-time data from clinicians seeing patients and how they interpret the patients that they see. This is by no means a comprehensive phenotypic assessment of any of these children that uh, have been used in studies of developmental delay. So when I refer to developmental delay in my talk, I'll be referring to this very broad spectrum of phenotypes. And I would add to that craniofacial as well as congenital heart defects. When I refer to the work that we've done in autism, specifically autism spectrum disorder, I'll be referring to the very specific ADIR, ADOS criteria that are used to define autism. And I'll distinguish them from really the large scale, scale study that we've done, from really the targeted uh, sequencing based studies that we've done on the latter. So I'm going to talk about the genetics of developmental delay and autism. I will not be talking about environmental influences. My background is in genetics, and this is the way I think about the disease. And a couple important points to get across initially. So the first is when we think about the genetics, geneticists, human geneticists for a long time have thought about really what we call simplex versus multiplex families. So simplex families simply refer to families where there's no history of autism in at least the recorded history of that family. So this would be an example of the mother and father unaffected with one child, in this case a male, affected with autism. Multiplex families refer to individuals where there's typically two or more affected. And this is always a little bit complicated by the definition of what people are using to describe autism developmental delay. There may be comorbidities that are segregated in the family as well. But these are the families typically that are recognized, uh, both in developmental delay as well as uh, autism. So studies have come out and suggested, I think, pretty convincingly that there is a strong genetic component. 90% of identical twins versus 10% for siblings or fraternal twins. It's pretty clear there's a strong uh, male bias in terms of the disease. So males are more likely to suffer from both developmental delay and autism, somewhere between two to four to one. And if we look at the broad category of developmental delay in our population, it's easily one out of every 50 births. So this is a huge impact in terms of health. 
And there have been a number of studies that have tried to estimate the rough, roughly genetic component, and these ranges range from all the way from 55% up to about 90%. But I think it's pretty safe to say that there is a very strong genetic component to autism. I think that's unquestionable. So the question is, what is it, and how have we gone after it? So as a community, kind of the old ways, that would be 10 years ago, in terms of studying the, human ge the genetic basis of autism, was to study it in the context of families to find, identify individuals, typically multiplex families where multiple individuals were affected, with the idea that there would be a few mutations associated with autism and work out the mutations in each one of these families using a variety of different methods, particularly linkage analysis, to identify. So these are kind of loosely referred to as Mendelian forms of autism, and it's generally recognized now that this has been pretty successful. About 8%, somewhere in that range, to 10% of autism fall under these more like syndromic Mendelian forms where, you, where they are within a given family and have been tracked to a specific uh, gene or a locus and found convincing evidence, usually replicated in multiple studies, that this is in fact causative. The other area which people have a broadly applied, not just to autism, but diseases like sch schizophrenia and other neuropsychiatric diseases, has been this idea of a case control design. This is what has been referred to in, uh, often as genome-wide association studies. And here the idea is pretty straightforward. You basically have a bunch of individuals that are affected and a bunch of, bunch of individuals that are unaffected. You're looking for common variation. In this particular case, so things that are relatively common in a population seen at a frequency usually greater than 5%. And you're trying to see if there's something different about the cases when compared to the controls. Generally, in terms of at least neuropsychiatric diseases, and this is not completely the case, but it generally has not found a lot of specific genes associated with uh, diseases such as autism. It has found regions in some cases, and some, some diseases have been more successful than others. But in general, this has not yielded a lot of fruit. The other thing that's been going on for some time, and this is where I'm going to pick up, is this idea that people would look at chromosomal aberrations. So look at big differences, chromosomal events, translocations, deletions, that they could see by looking at the cells of a patient under a microscope, looking for cytogenetic variation. And there's good data, for example, for the very famous one in chromosome 15, that on, on all of this combined is probably accounting for reasonably about 5% of the genetic basis. But if you add these, all, these numbers up, and if you believe that 60 to 70% of autism is uh, contributed by a genetic effect, we have a long ways to go. So the other thing you need to think about when you think about any type of disease, and this is not restricted to autism, is what type of variation are you looking for? So it not only matters in terms of the model of disease, whether it's familiar or not familial, but what also matters, what type of mutation? And again, no matter what organism you, you study, whether it's a fly or a C. elegans or a human, there is a wide spectrum of genetic variation, ranging from the very abundant single base pair changes in your genetic code that are different, all the way up to these large chromosomal rearrangement events that we can see under a microscope. And most of the emphasis, I would argue, in terms of human genetics, specifically in terms of genome-wide studies, has been focused, I would say, largely on trying to find single base pair changes and perhaps small insertion deletion variation events. What I'm going to talk to you today about is really large-scale variation, things that involve 10 kb, and most of the events I'll show you that I believe are pathogenic are going to involve hundreds of kilobases of sequence. The important point is, is that this type of variation could not be readily visualized cytogenetically, unless you have specific probes for it, but also can't be seen easily by sequence unless you actually have complete sequence. So this kind of falls in the middle zone of what people have been looking at historically with respect to these diseases. All right, so what is copy number variation? So copy number variation uh, belongs to a general type of genetic variation, which we call structural variation, in which you have dosage imbalances in the DNA. So if anybody has looked at cancer genomes and knows a little bit about cancer genomes, copy number variation was long appreciated in the field of cancer genetics before human geneticists got a hold of it in terms of germline disease. But what we're talking about generally, or at least in the simplest form, are losses of pieces of DNA or gains of pieces of DNA. We call those deletions or duplications. And I will use the word C and V to refer to this type of variation, so including both deletions and duplications. <coughs> So what is the approach? 
Well, when we came into this field, we actually initially start, started with the genome sequence itself. And the idea was to look at the genome and actually predict regions of instability based on the architecture of the genome. And I'll show you how we did this in a second. But the basic underlying hypothesis in our work was that intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder may be created or caused by new mutations that are very young. That is to say, either they're not in the parents or in fact may have emerged in maybe the last generation or two. Big gains or losses of DNA that have occurred fairly recently that are found in children with developmental delay and autism, but not in normal individuals. So it's a fairly simple model. And when we decided to select what types of diseases we would go after, instead of focusing initially on a neuropsychiatric disease, what we thought we would do was screen as broadly as possible children with developmental delay who had gone to the, the testing in clinic of looking for, for example, rearrangements cytogenetically, so they're carrier typically normal, they were negative by fragile X, they didn't have Down syndrome, for example, which turned out back in 2006 was about 80% of all kids that came, or more than 80% of all kids that came into the clinic for essentially genetic testing. And we were working on the idea that we would predict, we would identify many different regions of the genome that were actually going to be uh, contributing to disease. But any one of these regions would contribute a small proportion of the total uh, co uh, contribution to disease. So individually rare, but collectively common. So this map, this very busy map, is how we decided to strategize and how to go forward on it. So what I'm showing you here is a view of your genome showing you each of your chromosomes and what we determined from the sequencing of the human genome. So these blue lines represent pieces of DNA that are virtually identical that exist at two or more locations in your genome and that are very large. So everything that you can practically see here uh, for the, a given chromosome, at least 20,000 base pairs of sequence that is represented somewhere else in the genome with near perfect identity. So you can see here as an example what this little blue joining line represents is a piece of DNA that exists here and is here and is quite large. So a couple things I want you to get from this picture of your genome. The first thing that you should get right away is a distribution of those blue lines, which are those highly identical duplication, are highly non-random. You can see that certain chromosomes are just bombarded with these duplications. So here's an example, chromosome seven. Here's another example, chromosome 17. Well, other chromosomes are essentially almost devoid, chromosome 14 and 21, very few of these high identical duplications. And so the way to think about these duplications is think about a se segments of the genome that have actually duplicated somewhere in the past, millions of years ago, but not so far in the past, we, we can now still see that they're highly identical and related to one another. And so what you're looking at here is then a map of all those signal duplications. And we knew from really studies that had been done really almost 75 years ago that when you have duplicated sequences that are perfectly identical, what they can do is they can actually trick the recombination machinery during meiosis such that a recombination event occurs where it shouldn't occur. So you, if you remember your kind of basic biology, your chromosomes from your mom and your dad when you're going to produce sperm or egg actually have to align, and meiosis occurs. And as part of that process, there has to be a recombination event where it actually swaps out two of the chromosomes, one from your mom and one of your dad, breaks and reanneals and creates kind of a chimeric. And the way recombination works is it actually looks for sequence homology. So the way it knows to find your mom and your dad's chromosome and align them properly during meiosis is based on sequence identity. But there's a trouble. When you actually have duplicated sequences that are virtually identical, your, chromo your alignment machinery doesn't know to distinguish allele or things that are between the chromosomes versus things that are within, and actually can misalign. And so back in 2002, we predicted 130 regions of the genome that were going to be unstable because of the historical evolution of duplicated sequences that were bracketing regions that were unique that were loaded with genes. And we predicted those regions would be hot spots. And we had good evidence that this was not a bad model because diseases like VCF, the George syndrome, prader willi had already been documented. And in all these cases, the recurrence was mediated by the architecture of the genome, which was high identity duplications. And all of those were neuro neurodevelopmental neurologic defects. So we discovered another 130 potential regions, and we set out to actually test them in patients with disease for which no genetic di no diagnosis had been made. So this is just another simple way to show that. 
Here are your two, two of your four chromosomes misaligning during meiosis. So a recombination event is occurring where it shouldn't. So it's occurring between these duplicated sequences. Now you're creating gametes after two rounds of meiosis that either have additional copies of that duplicated sequence, or if you follow it through, have actually lost a copy of a duplicated sequence. But the important point here is that if your duplications are interspersed, that is to say they're, not, they're, not, they're separated from one, one another by unique sequence, everything that lives between these duplicated sequences gets taken along for the ride. And so now if you just follow this through, in addition to having an additional duplicated sequence, you also have acquired additional copies of genes A, B, and C. And in this particular case, you created a gamete that's lost genes A, B, and C. So this is a mechanism essentially for, dis for disease and for germline disease, specifically driven by the architecture of your genome. So all those 130 regions that we predicted back in 2002 had exactly this architecture, had at least 50 kilobases of a unique sequence flanked by duplications and therefore prone to gain and loss because of the genomic architecture. So once we identified those regions, we had to identify cohorts. And this is what we've ultimately screened over six years. So we didn't screen all this in one year, just pointing out. Um, this is uh, on the order of, of 24,000 individuals that we've now looked at. Children, primarily children with developmental delay, autism, autism spectrum disorder. So these would be the kind of the classic defined. This would be the more generally defined. And then idiopathic, adults with idiopathic generalized epilepsy even more recently. So to be absolutely clear what we're looking for, what we set out to find, is we set out to look for individuals with disease where parents were normal, and we would look to find evidence of deletions or duplications of a hotspot region flanked by duplicated sequence where the child had it and neither of the parents had it. And hopefully, if these occurred frequently enough, we would see evidence of more than this event occurring more than once. So we would ideally like to see is see children from different parts of the world, different areas, with the same event. And if everything worked to the way we, we hoped it would, those kids would even have similar features. And that would give us confidence that we've actually found a new syndrome mediated by this particular mechanism. So that was the strategy. We were a little bit naive about it in the beginning. I won't bore you with the details in terms of how we did it, other than to say that we borrowed technology from the cancer field developed uh, uh, by uh, Donna Albertson and Dan Pinkel called Array Comparative Genomic Hybridization, which was to look specifically at those regions, those 130 regions, and look for, for gains and losses in children with developmental delay. What I will show you is, this is the only really heavy data slide that I'll show you is an example of our first one. This is the first one that we identified in 2006. So just to orientate yourself, this is a chromosomal region. This is a region on chromosome 17. I'm showing you about a million base pairs of sequence. The, the duplications that are creating all the problems are shown here by these bars. And there's this unique region, which carries five genes. And when we did this analysis, the very first 200 patients that we screened that weren't, where there was no genetic cause, idiopathic mental retardation, turned out that we identified a 500 kilobase deletion corresponding precisely between these two duplications, which contain these five genes. Here are the four patients that we analyzed. And this little red gray here indicates the detection of that deletion. So everything from here almost to this point over here was deleted to one copy in these patients as opposed to the normal two. And when we tested the parents of each one of these, the parents did not show any evidence of this deletion of this critical region. So we looked at over 2,000 controls when we did this study. So these are typically developed uh, individuals and no one carried this particular deletion that was typically developing. Since then, we've actually analyzed close to 20,000 controls. And we've never observed this deletion in the normal population once. So when we felt pretty excited about this, we wrote this up, submitted it to Nature Genetics, and we found out there were two other papers from two other groups from different parts of the world that had come to the same conclusion with different approaches on the exact same region. And so we decided to join forces. One of those rarities in life where you get to publish all at the same time, we published back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back papers with Charles Shaw Smith and Bert de Vries uh, from the UK and, uh, and uh, Nijmegen. So what's really, there's a couple of interesting points about this. In all cases that have been looked at to date, there's no evidence that this is inherited. So this is almost always, at least as far as we know, a de novo mutation. 
500 kilobases of sequence that get deleted during meiosis because of the duplication architecture that's mediating it. With one or two exceptions, almost all the cases are of European descent. So, and we've actually, can, I can explain to you later if you're interested why that is. This, this is, it turns out to be a form of sporadic mutation that's almost specific to individuals of European ancestry. I'll show you one exception to this. All the events, as I mentioned, were sporadic and the features were syndromic. So these are what the children look like. These are four children from different parts of the world. You'll notice the protruding tongue in most cases, the bulbous nose. You see the kind of the pronounced philtrum in these kids. They've been reported pretty much in every clinical report where there's some description of the behavior. These kids are happy. They're happier than their unaffected siblings. They have a very positive disposition. Um, and in fact, uh, it's now, I think it's now, there's over about 100 cases that have been reported worldwide in the literature uh, over this specific region. So this is a really nice example. And for us, the kind of the clearest evidence that this was in fact causative was going back to a clinician, a dysmorphologist, and asking her to refer to us any patients that looked like these 12 photos that we had. And she pulled out 10 individuals, sent the DNAs to us, and six of those, four of those 10, in fact, carried that microdeletion, suggesting that this is clearly as good as you get in terms of kind of human genetic sporadic mutation as having a clinician go back. So this was a nice, clean example of a deletion recurrently deleted, explaining about somewhere between 0.3 to 0.4 percent of developmental delay in kids of European uh, descent. This wasn't the only locus we identified. So we identified essentially six new regions by screening on the order of about 1,000 to 2,000 children. This is another region. This one is actually incredibly rare, but it's in fact one of these syndromic forms once again. This is a different region of chromosome, this time chromosome 15, and it's a larger deletion of about three megabases, but once again has the same features. Duplications at the edge, which I'm not showing you here, and children that have very characteristic features. So almost all these kids have been described very kind of loosely as having autistic-like uh, features. They have problems with social interaction, repetitive behavior. But they also have features which you clearly can see, such as frontal bossing, uh, kind of the anterior, high interior hairline, pronounced ears, wide spacing between the eyes. So this is another very rare, less than 0.1. We think it's probably 0.05% of all cases that come in um, of, uh, that have this particular deletion with additional features like joint laxity, loose connective tissue, and growth retardation when those patients were, went back to and re-examined. This is a third example. This is a deletion that turned out to be a little bit more com vexing for us and a little bit more complicated. When we initially found this uh, deletion, um, we were kind of disappointed. We found it and we thought it had a wonderful candidate gene within the critical region. It was a nicotinamide acetylcholine receptor known as Cherna 7 And we, we looked at the individual patient and the patient was essentially uh, had, uh, this was the index patient that we identified. And it, she had in fact had a fairly s severe, and we, did, we, we checked many normals and we did not see this deletion in normal individuals. But we were disappointed when we actually tested the parents because the parents were, in this case, both reported as normal. Uh, and in this case, this one had, we had clearly inherited from the mom. So we kind of shelved this one and put this one aside, and we said, well, this is just some kind of rare variant that's not going to be relevant to disease. So meanwhile, we screened another 2,000 individuals, and we found two sporadic cases. These are these two young girls shown here to the right. There's almost no, at least that we couldn't see, or dysmorphologists couldn't see any kind of clear features that were common among them. All three individuals suffered very severe seizures in addition to having a developmental delay. So we went back to this kind of our initial index case, and we asked the clinician to go back to the individual family and reassess, in this case, both the mother and the father. It turned out that the mother was not normal. She had borderline uh, IQ, so she, was in, she had some impairment, but she had actually married twice. She had two children from two different marriages, and she had a second daughter born from a different marriage, which actually was more severely impaired and had actually segregated that particular deletion. She had a normal daughter from that second marriage, so she had a total of three daughters, and that daughter did not segregate the mutation. So after finding another three or four families and showing that this particular deletion could be both de novo and inherited, it's about 60% inherited and about 40% de novo, and not observing it in, in uh, control populations, we became convinced that this was at least a risk factor, if not causative, with respect to this disease. So there is really no syndrome here. 
This is very variable in its outcome. It clearly, individuals can be high functioning. They can, uh, they can function in society. This, this, this lady had a job. Uh, she never finished her high school uh, education, but she was not, would not be considered, she would not have been picked up by many different screens. What's interesting among many of the families that we saw segregating this mutation as well as the de novo case was that in addition to seizures, there was extreme rage and aggression. So almost like the opposite of the 17Q21 deletion syndrome. And I guess what really convinced us at the end of the day is when we really ramped things up and screened 22,000 cases of developmental delay and found 69 deletions and zero out of 8,328 controls, we became convinced that we had in fact found a pathogenic event. But this was just not fitting our nice model that we had in the beginning that it would be all de novo. So this was an eye opener for us because it suggested to us that these mutations are gonna be in the population segregating, probably not for many generations, but are gonna be contributing significantly to disease. And we might not recognize it. Some of these diseases may be of a different spectrum. For example, epilepsy versus essentially developmental delay. So some of the individuals will be relatively high functioning. So what's the proof? Well, after we reported this initial, we were the first to report this microdeletion in 2008. A number of other groups came out and actually reported this microdeletion in a whole suite of different diseases. So two big studies of ungodly proportion, something like 40,000 cases of schizophrenia between the International Schizophrenia Consortium and also a, a, a group out of Iceland, reported 0.2% of cases carry this microdeletion while none of their controls. And this is probably one of the most significant risk factors other than maybe VCF for schizophrenia. Later, it was reported as segregating in families with autism by David Miller, and then followed, I think, by another report by uh, uh, Tony Monaco. And then finally, in work that we did with a group out of Germany, we tested patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. So now this is, in fact, adults with idiopathic generalized epilepsy found essentially 12 cases out of 1,200 uh, northern Europeans that came this deletion. So that's 1% of idiopathic generalized epilepsy and zero out of 2,399 ethnically matched controls. So think about this for a minute. Each, even though that this is individually rare in each one of these diseases, the impact of this deletion alone is huge with respect to the health burden in society affecting schizophrenia, epilepsy, autism, and intellectual disability. So this isn't the only one, and I won't bore you with all the details. There were other ones, such as the deletion of 1Q21, which was as variable in terms of its outcome, associated also with schizophrenia, developmental delay, and in that particular case, congenital uh, heart defects as well as uh, cataracts in children. But we came up with this kind of very simplistic model, kind of the end of 2008, 2009, which went something like this. Our joint genome is essentially full of these landmines of hotspots of recurrent deletion and duplication. We have 130 of them. And we know that many of them are associated with diseases that are very frank and syndromic, like prader willi Williams syndrome, our 17Q21 example. But others are more complicated. So what's going on? Well, think about this for a minute. If you actually have a deletion that takes out three or four genes and you're now haploinsufficient, so you don't have enough dosage for that <laughs> disease or that specific region, you are affecting many different systems because those genes do very different things, some of them important in terms of development. You create what I would consider to be a highly sensitized child to disease. So that individual, if these events are necessary and sufficient when, when, when you're missing one set of copies, can result in a very strong syndromic disease, in which case you have it and you, you're all cases are sporadic. But if this individual essentially is not, is not, these event is not necessary and sufficient to drive disease, but creates a sensitized individuals. So half of the amount is insufficient, but what determines whether you develop schizophrenia, epilepsy, or intellectual disability depends on what other insult you have. And that insult could be determined by the environment, it could be determined by epigenetic factors, or it could be determined by other genetic events, either de novo or inherited, that came on that same background in that child. And you can clearly imagine that if, depending upon the disease that you have, that this can actually segregate back into the population. So you will have a family if, you're, if you have epilepsy and you're of high functioning. It's very likely you're gonna have a family and you will transmit again. But what's nice about this model is it helps to explain the comorbidities that we've seen between these various diseases and helps to explain the fact that we have both inherited and de novo events that are occurring for these large CNVs. And I think are important for kind of setting the stage for a model for thinking about autism and developmental delay more generally. So is there any evidence for additional genetic events? 
So this is the last syndrome that I'll show you per se, that, or at least I shouldn't say it's syndrome, the last, the, the last microdeletion that I'll show you that we're very convinced is in fact accounting for disease, but in a complex way. So this is work of Santosh Girirajan in my group who discovered this deletion on chromosome 16. It was again about 500 kilobases in size, involved 10 genes, and its odds ratio was something on the order of like 15. So that means you almost never saw it in controls, but you saw it in, in, in cases of intellectual disability quite often. It was again one of those micro deletions that was very variable in its outcome. Sometimes children were fairly mildly affected, like this child here to the, to the right. Others were severely uh, uh, mentally handicapped. Unlike the others that I described, almost all the cases that carry the 16P12.1 deletion, all of those cases were inherited. So we were shocked initially because we expect, well, 50-50, that makes some sense, not last long, but every one except one case were essentially inherited from a parent. So what we did is we went back and we asked whether there was any type of neuropsychiatric evaluation on these parents, because we now knew who were the carriers and who weren't the carriers. And Lucky for us, even though we've identified 20 or 25 families had it, we had about nine families that, in fact, a neuropsychiatric evaluation had been done on both parents prior to our determination of carrier status. And what we found was that in eight out of nine cases of the carrier parent that carried the 16P12, there had been some significant, serious neuropsychiatric illness associated with that, with that parent, ranging from bipolar to schizophrenia to major depression for 20 years. And in one out of nine cases, we saw this with the non-carrier parent. So we thought about that and I said, well, maybe the carrier parent actually has one of these related comorbid phenotypes. But why did we ascertain these kids to be developmentally delayed? That's clearly a different phenotype. So the other piece of information which we thought was really informative, when we looked at the entire genome for large copy number variation, what we found was that in 25% of the cases that we had ascertained, there was another either deletion or duplication at a different chromosomal region. So you might ask, well, how unlikely is that to, to happen? Well, in this population, we would expect to see what we call two hits of CNVs, about 0.4%. And even if we condition on the presence of the first CNV, this was highly significant. So in other words, too many double hits in kids with developmental delay with the 16P12.1 deletion. And that would be completely consistent with this idea that one hit may be sufficient to result in a milder phenotype, i.e. a neuropsychiatric condition, but two hits was required to ascertain a child with developmental delay. But this we used to propose, I think, what we called a two hit, I and mean, we got chastised for it, so we now refer to it as the second site model. So two different loci in heterozygous, uh, kind of you know, found in different chromosomal regions. So the model goes something like this. You have one parent, and it, let's say this could be a simplex family, so no family history, but this parent maybe has some kind of neuropsychiatric condition. One event has, is transmitting in that family. She, this individual, this mother, transmits to the son, but another mutation occurs in that son, so two mutations, one maybe new mutation and one inherited mutation, compound to result in a child with a severe outcome, in this case, developmental delay. Is there any other evidence for this? Well, we did what was kind of not an obvious experiment. It was the idea that my student and I had. We sat down, we said, well, if this is a general model, maybe what we should do is go back to all those cases where people thought there's going to be an inherited component. So go back to those families where there's a family history of autism. So here's an example of that pedigree. And let's look at, so we screened 747 families uh, with autism, which were fall, considered to be multiplex by that definition. And then look in this generation, comparing the affected individual to the unaffected individual, and ask a very simple question. Is there a difference in the number of de novo CNVs in the affected individual with respect to the unaffected individual? And if you think about that, that's kind of a backwards experiment, right? Because genetics have already determined that this is an inherited predisposition to autism. And what we're looking for is sporadic mutations to be different between affected and unaffected kids from an inherited family with autism. And what we found when we did this, and we want to repeat this, we haven't replicated this in another cohort, so I'm just presenting this data of our observation, is we found out that the affected individuals from these 747 families had more de novo mutations than the unaffected sibling by fourfold. So there were way more de novo CNVs in the affected child 
than the unaffected child. And in fact, the unaffected child had a lower rate of CNVs to no mutations than what we saw in the general population. Almost as if they would have been affected with autism, but they didn't have another mutation by chance that came in there. So this actually observation has really influenced, and the earlier observation from Santosh Giri Rajan has really influenced the way we think about modeling the genetics of autism and more broadly neuropsychiatric disease. All right, so again, this would be consistent, although not a proof, I want to emphasize, of a one plus one, uh, two mutations coming together to lead to autism. So in summary, we targeted regions flanked by segmental duplications. We turned them genomic hotspots. We identified six new recurrent microdeletions. Some were syndromic, like the 17Q21. Some were essentially variable in terms of their outcome. But I'm pretty confident on the ones that I'm listing here, at least, that these are pathogenic. So you can determine whether you believe they're causative or not, but they're clearly, the odds ratios are very high for these particular ones. We have this distinction between syndromic CNVs versus variable expressive. Then we have this observation of, for at least the ones that are really inherited, having too many double hits, at least for the 16P12, uh, in uh, individuals with intellectual disability. So this is great, but here's some basic problems with CNV work. CNV work, essentially up to at least what we've done up to date, typically involves finding very big events. So these events typically involve hundreds of kilobases, many different genes, not just one gene. So we don't know which, which are the genes. And remember, when I did this screen, I didn't do it genome-wide initially. I did it initially focusing on hotspot regions. So what goes on in the rest of the genome we know is important. But the problem with the rest of the genome, because it doesn't have this architecture of recurrence, doesn't, there's no mechanism to mediate a recurrent deletion or duplication, most of the CNVs that you would see in a clinic that are large are going to be one-offs. You see them once, but you just don't see them again in 2,000 patients, because they just they occur so infrequently. But they're collectively quite common. So how can we solve these pr problems? So basically, how do we get to the genes, and how do we prove the rest of these CNVs as being pathogenic that are not in hotspot regions? So two different solutions. One is go just essentially employ essentially a genome-wide analysis, but in steroids. Start looking at tens of thousands of cases and tens of thousands of controls. So you will eventually begin to see events, even in, non, in non-hotspot regions that are recurrent. And the second is, well, if you want to get at the genes, why don't you look for smaller events? So if there really is one gene in that region of five to 10 genes, you should find a disruptive mutation if you actually sequence all the genes in that region. And I'll share with you some, some data from both of these. So for the first side, we did this collaboration with Signature Genomics, which looks, looked at a total of 15,767 children with developmental delay that were referred to their lab uh, based on uh, di uh, diagnostic criteria, sometimes very loosely described as developmental delay. In about 48% or half the cases, there was more detailed information, such as whether there's epilepsy, autism spectrum, cardiovascular defect, or so on with these children. We compared them to 8,328 adults that have been used in other studies. So don't think of this as a, really a, a match control. Think of it as like a population average that we're comparing it against. These are individuals that weren't ascertained for mental health, but we usually were picked up in terms of genome-wide association studies for studies of lipid, concentration, blood pressure, asthma. Generally, diseases that we do not think, and we have good evidence, are not large CNV events. And let's compare the landscape of large and rare CNVs for basically events greater than 200 kilobases, with the idea that we have way more power because we can detect in these controls much smaller events than we can do in these diagnostic arrays. And the important point here is that we reanalyze all the data ourselves. So we didn't trust any clinical lab, even though Signature does a great job, but we wanted to do it all from first principles in terms of signal intensity data, including the SNP microarray data. We wanted to do all our own calls. And so this is what we published in the mid-summer uh, last year, essentially a comparison of overall CNV burden. So what you're looking at in this chart is two lines, one for cases with developmental delay, or largely intellectual disability, in red, and then our control line indicated here in black. And what's indicated here on this axis is the proportion of either patients or controls that had a CNV of a given size or greater, okay? So if you use this magical mark that some clinical labs or diagnostic labs use of 500 kilobases of being potentially pathogenic, what you'll see is essentially 25% of children that come into the diagnostic referral lab will actually have a CNV 500 kilobases or greater compared to about 8% of the general population. So this leads to a potential observation that about 
of developmental delay may be explained by large C and V events, just based on that differential. It's different for different types of diseases, or at least different referrals. I shouldn't say diseases, because this is not detailed phenotype information. This is fairly, fairly loose. But it's interesting to see that things, for example, like craniofacial defects, which are some referrals, usually most of these are associated with developmental delay. Cardiovascular defects come up as the highest in terms of CNV burden. Well, diseases such as autism and epilepsy, while significant compared to the green line here, no question, are not as burdened by CNVs, although all of them are show an increase. This leads to kind of the general feeling that the larger the CNV, or let's say CNVs will be associated with more severe outcomes than essentially um, uh, for, than diseases that have less severe. So once you get all this data together, you can build on what we call a morbidity map. So what we're doing here is we're taking all the CNVs that we see in patients, and we're, com we're basically creating a map. So everything above the line here rep represents affected individuals, blue indicating duplications, red indicating deletions, and everything below the line represent the controls, the adult controls. And you don't need statistics. You can just look at this map for a given chromosome. So this is chromosome 15 at the top. And you can see the landscape looks very different. There are certain regions that are just showing piles up. So for example, this region I'm showing here to the left, over here on chromosome 15 to th in the left corner here, this is prader willi 15Q13 is the next one over. And you can see that in the controls, it's essentially virtually absent. You can do this for every one of the chromosomes of our genome. And in fact, you can combine data, which we did with another lab, now increasing it to 30,000 cases and 10,000 controls. And the landscape of copy number variation associated with developmental delay becomes more and more transparent as you increase the numbers of cases and controls. So pretty amazing stuff, I think, because if we could combine diagnostic lab data from, let's say, 100,000 cases and compare them to 50,000, I think we would raise up another probably 50 loci that we would have statistical significant as being pathogenic, or at least potentially pathogenic, in the human population. And what's really cool about these regions, so there's 59 CNV regions. There's 14 new regions that we identify that reach statistical significance. And underlying these regions, these 59 plus 14, are a total of 940 of the 20,000 human genes. It doesn't prove that any one of those individual genes is actually causative, but it says some subset of that 940 is important to actually consider. And then finally, what we've, what we've done, which I think is, to me, one of the most exciting things, is we've gone back to this two-hit model more generally. Because remember, we showed it for 16P12.1. We showed that there was an excess of doubletons, or two CNVs or more. And so with this kind of data, with this many cases indicated here in this case column, these are the number of cases from 20,000 uh, children that were referred with various deletions, including to George Williams, 17Q21. <laughs> what we decided to do was essentially break them into two categories, those that were variable in terms of their outcomes, so they could sometimes manifest as epilepsy, schizophrenia, developmental delay. These are shown here in gray. And I'm only showing you a subset of the 60, because this becomes un uh, kind of totally unreadable if I showed you all of them. And then I show you on the top ones that are pretty much considered to be syndromic, maybe with the exception of DeGeorge, which is VCF, which is also variable. And what I'm plotting here are really two different numbers. From all the cases that we have, in this column here, so in the case of smith McGuinness, 100% of these 25 were de novo, that is to say they weren't inherited. Well, here's at the very bottom is our 16P12 deletion, where essentially only 4% of the cases that we've identified were essentially de novo versus the proportion of second hits. So how many of these patients actually carried another large CNV greater than 500 kilobase in addition to the primary event somewhere else in the genome, either deletion or duplication? And that's shown here by the second hit. So you see this 0% to 21.9%. And so once again, here are the controls, conditioned and unconditioned. You can see there's a big difference with the things becoming significant right around the 16P11.2 deletion, where we start to see an excess of doubletons, or two, two CMVs or greater in these. But what's striking to me is when you look at this, it's almost in an inverse relationship. As the proportion of de novo events goes down and things become more inherited, there's an increase in the proportion of two hits. So what about the genes? Can we get at the genes? So at the end of the day, we get all these candidates that come from the CMV analysis. And what's great about the CMV work is that it actually produces a, a prior, kind of a roadmap for potential candidate genes. 
So depending on how we do this math, it is either 940 or 1,300, somewhere in that range. And in some cases, we get lucky, and we're able to essentially refine the breakpoints. So this is that 17Q21 deletion syndrome that I showed you before, showing you here the, deletion, the duplications that are, that are flanking the region and the deletion that goes and takes out these roughly uh, nine genes. But what we were lucky to, to find is when we screened enough cases, 20,000 individuals, and we found 31 cases with that deletion, we found two patients that had atypical deletions. That is to say, the breakpoints break weren't mediated by the segmental duplications themselves. So they got smaller and smaller. And then the question is, do they have the phenotype? Do they look like the 17Q21 kids? And the answer is yes. So here's an example where we, we didn't nail the gene yet, but we got damn close. We got down to three genes, either the Kaya 1267 Cytoin, or LRCC37. And we have a child. This is the child shown here at the very bottom uh, with this deletion map indicated here who actually has all the features, the cup-shaped ears, the bulbous nose, the pronounced philtrum, skeletal defects of the hand, just like we saw in the European cases. And she has the atypical deletion. So there's great value to combining the data to actually narrow down critical regions. But after a while, we kind of gave up that we're actually going to find, because the resolution of these diagnostic arrays is just too, too limited. How about we just sequence all the genes? And so many of you know that this technology, which seemed unfathomable probably, what, three years ago? is now becoming commonplace, where we can go into a genome and we can sequence for about $1,000 all the protein coding sequence. So of the 20,000 genes, 190-some thousand exons, we can get information on about 90% of them with high accuracy. And this has been due to some advancements in the technology, which I won't go into, but have just really transformed the field. And so. While CNVs have been great to give us that 35,000 foot view, if we really want to get the specific genes, and we really believe there's going to be a few genes responsible for the vast majority of cases with developmental delay and autism, at least at an individual level, what we've got to be able to do is resequence the genes. When we take all of these mutations, and I have to tell you my perspective on this, I'm not a believer, I'm slowly converting, but I'm not a believer in protein-protein interaction pathways, or I haven't been historically. My postdocs are showing me the light. Sometimes it, you know, old dogs have to learn new tricks. If you take all of these mutations and you look at the proteins that they produce and you ask the question, do they interact as part of a common pathway, what we were able to find is that essentially 39% of the disruptive mutations are part of one highly interconnected pathway. So this is the pathway that we see, and these are the genes that are involved with the type of mutation that we saw, whether it's a missense mutation, and remember, these have to be severe missense. They have to be in sites that are highly conserved for evolutionary time. Deletions of amino acids, frame shifts, splice variants that disrupt the, the, the splice of predicted splice, splicing of the gene or nonsense mutations. What we find is a highly interconnected pathway of potential protein-protein interaction. So every line there that joins is evidence of a direct, there's evidence in the literature of a direct protein to protein interaction between a gene, one protein, and another protein. So is this significant? So we simulated this, and we can show by simulation that this network has way more connectivity. Every gene or every protein in this network is, is essentially related to every other protein by about two and a half connections. It's highly interconnected, and much more than you'd expect based on chance. And so simulation means you just go back and you resample the whole collection of protein-protein interactions and say, do you ever observe this? We ran this simulation 10,000 times, never observed it once. Hmm, maybe. I'm still not a believer. Well, what if we seeded this pa pathway, and there's methods to do this, work that has actually been developed right at University of Washington. What if we seeded this, the, the known, or at least what's thought to be, high probability candidate genes for autism against this network? So you can actually seed networks with genes that aren't in the network and ask, are you likely to be enriched for autism genes versus not? This network is significantly enriched for autism genes from the Betancourt list that we actually selected, that were actually about 100 genes. Again, it's interesting. But again, I'm not a believer. The part that made me believe was this last part. And we had data from 50 unaffected siblings. So that means we had exome sequence data, so the protein coding sequence, and we asked the question, when we look at the new mutations that are validated, does this network come up from the unaffected SIBs? And the answer is no. We do not see this network coming up. And we now pushed it to 100 unaffected siblings, and we do not. So I'm not sure how to, to be, I wouldn't bet the ranch on this yet, 
But to me, this is really exciting because if you really believe that understanding networks is going to be important to developing therapies, this is an important first step. And the beauty of essentially exome sequencing is it gives you the specificity that you can't get from CNVs. Because in the CNV land, we would have had 940 genes of which most of them would have nothing to do with the etiology. So if you take anything from this uh, talk away, I want you to keep in mind that large copy number changes in your DNA are occurring all the time as you generate sperm and egg. They occur quite frequently, and hotspots are occurring at orders of magnitude more frequently than any other area of the genome. We know that, or we, we estimate, and others have estimated, that about 6 to 8% of cases of autism are probably associated with these large, very rare, about half of these are highly recurrent. In the case of development of delay, more broadly, it's about 14% of the cases have these large CMVs that we think are pathogenic. If we combine all the data that we have from the CNV world, as well as essentially the data that we have from the limited exome sequencing that we and two other groups have done, the estimate is that there are 500, probably to about 1,000 different genes that contribute to autism and more for developmental delay. So that doesn't mean you have to have mutations in all 500 genes. One or two of them is sufficient to result in disease. But in every individual that you would sample, at least in a small sample size, it would be a different subset of genes responsible. So that's sobering. But I don't think it's intractable. Keep in mind that the same genetic event, at least as measured by CNVs, can manifest very differently. So keep in mind the 15Q11 or 15Q13.3 microdeletion, which is 1% of idiopathic generalized epilepsy, 0.3% of development delay, probably about 0.2% of autism and 0.2% of schizophrenia. Both inherited and new mutations are important, but the key take home for me is it's the type of mutation that matters. And geneticists have, should have realized this. It, disruptive gene-killing mutations that you know, take out an entire copy of a gene or alter the dosage significantly or create a stop codon are probably of the most important in terms of neuropsychiatric and uh, diseases such as development and delay. And finally, sequencing of these genes, I think, is providing a spe specific candidates. But kind of the upshot is that we need to do many, many more exomes before we we'll start to see recurrence. But we're starting to see recurrence already, which is a really good sign. That means we're starting to see the same, same genes hit more than once. So autism, all of us know, is an umbrella disease. Development of delay is even a bigger umbrella, right? But I see all of these as kind of a, a, a spectrum of diseases. So epilepsy, schizophrenia, there's a component to the etiology of all those diseases that is shared. And I think I'm becoming a believer in you know, the Danny Weinberg a kind of model, Weinberger, the idea of essentially a neurodevelopmental hypothesis for these. And just like cancer, there are hundreds of different of ways to actually get genetically autism. Large copy number variation explains a significant fraction, about 10%. Smaller point mutations, and I'm trying to be conservative here. I could go over the top on this one, but I'm, I've, I've, been, I've, had, I've checked with some of my colleagues about this, and we kind of agree on this number right now. We could be totally wrong, but of 15 to 20% of disruptive mutations within the coding sequence. We still haven't surveyed all the other mutations out there that are out there in the genome. And I think all the data is pointing to us that essentially the brain, and maybe this is not a big revelation, the brain, and particularly during development, is highly sensitive to dosage imbalances. So where have we come? Well, in 2007, a small portion of the, ch of the pie of autism, I think, could be explained genetically, largely by large chromosomal events that were seen under a scope, such as the chromosome 15, large duplication, and then single gene syndromes, and not put into that category, fragile X, Rett syndrome, and their contributions to autism. We are at the precipice right now, and there's a big question mark over the exome, because I don't want to put this in firm writing. I'm pretty confident in saying 10% of by large CNVs. We haven't begun to even survey the small CNVs, which I think will contribute easily another 10%. And I haven't put that up there. But I think the preliminary data suggests to us that it's not unreasonable to think that 15 to 20% of autism is caused by disruptive, either de novo or very young mutations uh, in individuals. That isn't bad progress, I think, for five years. And I think we're going to have at least for the genetics, the heritable component of autism, I think it's not unreasonable to assume that we will have 60% of it within the next couple of years. And the real power of this isn't from just a discovery, but it's for the molecular convergence that may come from essentially the pathways. So if there are 500 genes, that sounds insurmountable. 
but if those converge on 10 pathways, those are 10 pathways that can be targets for therapy. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that therapy is around the corner. I think that's the biggest mistake that geneticists make. I think the most important thing that I've seen from the work we've done in the CNVs is that when we select from that great umbrella a developmental delay, and we can pinpoint the 0.3% that can carry the 15Q1 3.3, or the 0.4% that have the 17Q2131, what we immediately do, which I think most researchers don't appreciate, and maybe even some clinicians don't appreciate it, is that we actually create networks of families. When the 17Q21 families get together and they've had their first get-togethers over the last two years, for them it has been an illumination. Because when they told them that their child had developmental delay, how often I've heard mothers say this, my Johnny was never like those other kids. But when they get together with a family, with 12 families, with 25 families that have the exact same lesion, there are solutions, very practical solutions, that mothers that have worked with these kids for 20 years can impart to new mothers with those diseases. And to me, that's priceless, because we have the ability to really affect people's lives in very dramatic ways. So yes, the therapies down the road are important. To be able to distinguish a Fragile X from a RET from a 17Q21 is valuable, because we'll know, we'll know which smart therapy should work. But I think there's a much more practical value right up front, which is the connections between the families. So I'll leave you with this last slide. This is our working simplified model of autism. Many genes need to be expressed at, the, at many different times and places during development. Dra brain development is in particular, probably at very specific stages during development, sensitive to gene expression differences. Many different genes and pathways, when compromised, probably in combination in some cases, and sometimes by solo, either by a copy number variant or a point mutation can result in a child with autism. So this is the model that we're going forward on. And I think is as we go into genomes and we comprehensively understand the copy number variation and we comprehensively understand the point mutations and the inheritance of those mutations and their frequency in the general population, we're going to get better and better at diagnosis, pathogenicity, and really targets for therapies down the road. And I'll leave you with essentially the most important slide. These are the folks that did all the work. I'm the mouth, mouthpiece these days. Uh, particularly want to acknowledge Brad Coe, Santosh Giri Rajan, and Brian O'Rourke. Brad and Santosh, and with some help from now a, a young assistant professor, Greg Cooper, did most of the CMV morbidity map. Uh, Andy Sharp and Heather Mefford were the ones that discovered some of the, the, the hotspot regions associated with disease. Brian O'Rourke did the exome sequencing. We couldn't do this without our great collaborators at University of Washington. Jay Shinduri, for example, developed some of the exome sequencing technologies uh, in his own lab. And then we've had great clinical colleagues, remarkably, many of them from Europe. For some reason, the folks over there have been very open. And we've, even though they've been our former competitors, we've worked together for at least 10 years with uh, many of these groups. And then also Lisa Schaefer at Signature Genomics. Um, that was a great collaboration to really kind of expand the numbers. And then last but not least, um, really the patients and their families. Uh, we couldn't do this without families being willing to be reconsented to come back in for further study. And it's been actually really one of those surprising things for a researcher that comes from genome sequencing to be able to actually make really significant contributions at an individual level, not at the level of publishing in Nature or Science, but actually making a difference in the life of a family. All right, thanks. Thank you very much for the great presentation. So you showed 6 to 8% burden of copy number variants among account for autism. But from clinical perspective, many of those look like contiguous gene syndromes. Mm -hmm. My question is, is the, is the occurrence of copy number variant um, changes in idiopathic autism same or higher? These are children that have autism but no associated anomalies yeah, because so if you if i understand correctly you, it's your initial I mean, it's population was uh, with developmental delay and you excluded those with recognizable syndromes right. yet many of those 
have associated anomalies. And so for example, the Simons collection was excluded from most syndromic forms of autism. So that number, 6 to 8%, why it's not 14%, comes from the surveys of those data themselves. So what we're looking at really there is idiopathic autism, where most of the large CMVs have already been excluded. So, and I think, so I think that number is still an underestimate, because remember, most of the surveys, including the ones that were recently published in Neuron, only went down to about 100 kilobases, 150 kilobases in size. And my feeling is, is as we get to these, you know, these ones where we could call them higher functioning autists or children with autism, you will find C and Vs. I'm convinced of it, but they're going to be much smaller. They'll be gene disruptive, but there will be things that you wouldn't have picked up on a clinical array. Right. And so we have a separate effort on that regard right in the lab, and others, I'm sure, are doing the same thing. So you ask why. I mean, why, why does this mechanism exist? This is also a hypermutation, kind of a hypermutational mechanism. And, uh, you know, if you believe uh, or you accept um, Darwinian evolution, these are creating variations on which natural selection which will act, and some of those will be beneficial. If we extend the story, you know that we showed and others showed that your segmental duplications and copy number variations are highly enriched in places where the genome evolves, where chromosomes rearrange themselves. And uh, we and, and propose and others that some of those rearrangements would be adaptive, okay? Mm -hmm. And so what we talk about here is always the negative side, the disease side. And um, I'm, we're very interested, as you know, in the adaptive side as well. So the slide, what triggered this thought is the slide on IQ, mm -hmm. okay? And I, I wonder, uh, here's the Nobel Prize experiment, right? I don't know. But if you, if you took, um, you know, if you looked at the reverse, if you really looked at a high, I, you know, took a stratified population by IQ, many of which have behavioral and developmental disorders at the high end, uh, since these are the, really the seeds of our own evolution, many of the mutations are deleterious, many may be adaptive. If you stratified by IQ, would you see CNVs um, segregating or so, at least so identified at the high IQ? So we've done this experiment, and it's not the best way we did. I can tell you what we did. So it took forever to get this through IRB. So it was a pain in the butt to get this approved. But we finally got it approved, and we looked at, uh, it was 200 individuals from Mensa. And we looked for an increase or some difference with respect to the general population. We saw nothing at the level of 200 KB. But, but let me turn it around another way, because th this is the, the other talk which I didn't give today, which is the benefit of actually having this duplication architecture. So it turns out that when we've, done, we've been, tried to be as exhaustive as we could on this, and we tried to do this with experiments as well. We've surveyed about 14 different mammalian lineages, of which six of them are primate, for essentially this pattern. So remember, the important thing here isn't just the presence of duplication, but it's the fact that there are duplications that are interspersed, that are separated from each other by large distances. And what we found is that this is not an anomaly, but it's significantly enriched in the great ape human lineage. So when you go back, great apes and humans, so you see lots of interspersed intrachromosomal. And we actually published several papers on this, and we published one in Nature recently that showed that there is an excess, a burst, if you will, right in the common ancestor of human, chimp, and gorilla. And then it subsided. And so why? Well, it turns out, if you actually look at the duplicated sequence, it isn't just generic sequence. It is extremely gene-rich sequence and encodes preferentially genes, at least the parent genes, that are involved in neurodevelopment. And this is, we've done it, we've tested, there's a paper that just came out from another group that shows that these new genes, and we call them kind of new innovations, potential new genes, are actually very highly expressed early in development. And so in data that I don't, didn't have time to go into, we've actually been tracking with some neuroscience groups, um, specifically these newly minted genes, specifically ones that have evolved specifically as a result of this duplication, which creates disease. And we have some pretty strong evidence that these genes are important in terms of actually neuronal migration, as well as, in fact, setting up dendrites and, and spine formation in the human brain. If this is true, and I, again, we pref preface this, we just, it's just early stages, there's a yin for the yang here. Those duplications which are causing disease in our children are, may also be important for specifying some of the adaptations that make us human. But that's a limb statement. I'm on a big limb when there's a big saw behind me. But yeah. essentially, we've been thinking about this idea for at least 12 years with some of the first papers we published on this. Yeah. There's just too much evolutionary action, not even at the, not at just the structural level in terms of chromosomal rearrangements during chromosomal evolution, but in terms of innovation of new genes. It's just not, it's not 
it's not, it does not follow just simple chance events. There's strong evidence from an evolutionary perspective of selection operating on this. Yes. And all we need now is functional proof. Do you think the segmental duplications have a structural role in the genome and um, in the three-dimensional architecture? So. Yeah, no, we thought about this, but we, ha we have no evidence for it. So one idea may be that somehow the duplications themselves communicate somewhat in the genome like um, by proximity. And the reason I say that is that we know that some of the regions that are rich in segmental dupl duplications, which include regions around acrocentric regions and areas that have been sites of historical exchange, actually can be seen to form you know, nucleoli and other types of things. So the cause or consequences thing there is a difficult thing to imagine. The other ideas that some people have thrown around is perhaps the duplicated sequences are regulated differently. Maybe they form their own kind of chromatin. Um, but again, we don't have any evidence for that. Someone might, but we don't at this point. I have a few questions, um, so I'll just throw them all out. Uh, one of them was uh, very early on you talked about, I think it was the 17Q11 that was mostly in North Amer uh, northern European populations. It, how large were the non European populations that you looked at, and so we've was done, that part of it? So we've done some targeted screening of about 3,000 African Americans for mm -hmm. that particular deletion. And you know, in a, you know, remember those first 200 that we screened, we found four cases, and we have not seen the event. Mm -hmm. The one that I showed you here came just you know, the one that was atypical that narrowed down the critical region. That one came from the large uh, uh, 15,000 from Signature, and was we, was a surprise to us. In fact, both of those atypicals were African American. The the reason, so I was hoping someone would ask me this. The reason that Europeans are predisposed, and this comes back to the, your question actually, mm -hmm. that. Some of you may or may not know that this region of the genome is also a site of a common inversion polymorphism. So in about 25% of, of the Europeans, uh, people of European descent, this region is, the order of the genes is flipped around. Okay, so you say, well, that's weird. Yeah, it is weird. You don't see it very often. You don't see it at that frequency. And you don't see it outside of Europe, practically. It's almost non-existent in every other population, including Asians and Polynesians and other types of things. But what's remarkable is the reason that Europeans are predisposed is that on that haplotype, which has that inverted inversion structure, new duplications have evolved. And those duplications are now in a direct orientation, so they face like this. And in every other human population, they have duplications, but they look like this. And so you can't do unequal crossing over if your things aren't in a direct orientation. So that's kind of one of the rules. So in Europeans, we created this new architecture, which has the duplications like this, flips the region, creates duplications now in direct orientation, and now predisposes Europeans to microdeletion. So we just recently submitted a paper, which is you know second round, where we show that the breakpoints actually occur in those European-specific direct duplications. And coming back to the adaptation, the data from another group, Kari Stephenson, suggests that individuals, at least in Iceland, that carry the inversion tend to have higher fertility and fecundity than individuals without uh, the inversion. And so, yeah. Take what you will from that. But that would be an example of an adaptation, nothing to do with IQ, but something that was selectively beneficial for some reason in northern Asian. European populations. But the consequence is we have children that have developmental delay because of the new architecture that has evolved. So, and my other question is on a totally tough, different question, which is that um, this is sort of my ignorance. Do the sporadic um, de novo non-inherited um, mutations, uh, or CNVs or what have you, do they arise during meiosis or at the time of conception? Well, so the thought is that most of them occur during meiosis, and we have some evidence because we can distinguish between meiotic one and meiotic two by tracking essentially the recombination events themselves, whether it's occurred on sister chromatids or homologous chromosomes. So there's ways of doing that. But there is some data that's been I mean, there's, there's no reason to presume that at least those cases that are meiosis two, which wouldn't actually show any flanking exchange, that it couldn't be somatic events that are occurring very early during conception. And there's some work done by a couple groups that have shown identical twins don't necessarily have identical C and V patterns, um, but they're very rare. So most of the C and V patterns, and there's some, been some question in the last six months whether, you know, what fraction shows somatic. But the, the answer is we don't know. So we think based on sampling that we've done of in a few individuals of multiple tissues, the CMVs are seen in most somatic tissues. So it suggests that if it is uh, somatic, that it occurs early, during, you know, after conception. And clearly, when you have the recombination of flanking markers, that's got to be. I think the only way that could be is by my, meiosis one. Right. So if it's, so 
that would suggest that events for males and events for females would be, we'd want to look at very different um, Well, only in a case, yeah, okay. I guess. I mean, males, I mean, events can occur on autosomes but equally likely between males and females. It depends, well, yes, okay. So, I mean, the, the, w maybe related to this, that there's another group that's looked at this question. So the question is, is there a paternal-maternal bias for CNV formation? And the answer, it's always a little bit more complicated. For the hot spots, the answer is no. It occurs in both males and females about the same frequency. For the sporadic cases, for, that's not sporadic, but the ones that are not mediated by hot spots, let's say across the genome, which is about 60% of all large CNVs that are not mediated by hot spot sequences, those ones show a paternal bias, suggesting replication is playing an important role for non-recombination-based -recombin mechanisms of recurrence or a mutation. I've, I've got a really short question, and it's very naive. So a, a lot of this uh, transmission work for determining whether you have a de novo or a, a inherited, whether it's paternal or maternal, looks at somatic cells, basically blood DNA. Absolutely. Has anybody gone in to look at sperm DNA or? Yes, and not our group. So Matt Hurls did some of this work early on, looking at three loci that were known genomic disorders and looking at sperm DNA. And the interesting thing is a paper published in Nature Genetics about four years ago is the rates that he estimated were very close to what the kind of the new mutation estimates were based on observation, which I always thought was a bit unusual because I expect under ascertained samples. For example, I expect BCF to be more common, just that not all cases are observed. But his data, he looked at three and they were pretty close to what the predicted mutation rate would be in sperm. So he didn't look at eggs. That was an impossible experiment to do. Is there, is there a correlation between the maternal age and the occurrence of mutation? You showed that 75% of the mutations by exome sequencing come from the um, spermogenesis. And now you just mentioned that uh, these CMVs, which are not mediated by recombinant, by uh, homologous recombinations, also occur more um, on the paternal line. Is there correlation with paternal age as in achondroplasia and some other skeletal disorders? So for the SNPs, absolutely yes. So there's a, there's a nice R squared. I can't remember what it is, but it's pretty strong. So older dads, more new, they would tend to have more new uh, mutations. For CMV, it's a trend right now. The numbers aren't big enough. So you can't say it's a significant, but there is a trend. So I think old dads have a lot to explain for, because they, they really are contributing disproportionately to new mutations, both from CNV and from um, um, uh, point mutation. That's what I tell the students after I tell them that. But I, when I give this lecture, when I teach the, uh, the graduate students, I always start with Down syndrome, and then I show that maternal age effect. And all the, all the girls or women in the group are all like, oh, crap. And I said, well, I said, well, men, you have your own clock. Let me show you your clock. Um, this is sort of the 80-pound gorilla in the room. Does copy number burden uh, predispose or make individuals more susceptible to environmental modifiers? Yeah, I, th I think that's a reasonable uh, hypothesis because we now know we have collections of CNVs that are clearly high odds ratios, right? So they're if they're not pathogenic, they're at least the very strong risk factors. But we know that they're not, ne they're not by themselves sufficient to drive the disease, right? Because they're inherited from normal, quote unquote, parents who may have a comorbid, comorbidity. Um, so I think another way to think about this is, you know, 25% of the 16P12s have another large CNV. What explains the other 75%? Uh, and when we typically draw the model, we include essentially other mutations that we haven't ascertained, which I think is very likely, environmental insults, and even stochastic differences during development, which I think is probably also equally likely. When you implant, how fast you grow, whether you have competition, I think those could be reasonable things. Tracking that will be tough, but I, I think a good way to do it is actually to ascertain the most variable CNVs, because those are like the sensitized background, and then to see what other mitigating uh, features have gone on uh, in their family history, their exposures, what have you. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. 
their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.